Thank you. So uh, <clears throat> we have to be uh, fairly tight in our timing today because um, the people who just left are coming back. Uh, so um, the uh, object today is objective of today is to tell you a little bit about one of those rare phenomena, a, mount, a, a, a conservation success story, something where you can point and say, look, we can get it right if certain things happen and perhaps ask what lessons we can draw from that. And if I can um, keep that uh, to time, then Katie, who coordinates the April Alliance, uh, will say a little bit about how, if you have the time and the energy and the motivation, and you're here, so clearly you have at least uh, two or three of those uh, characteristics, you might want to get involved more in the April Alliance. And some of you I know already are involved so apes need allies. Why do they need allies? Why, why aren't they just getting on with their lives in the forest um, as they have done for millennia, millions of years? Uh, well, the reason for that <laughs> will become clear. Um, but let me introduce this particular ape. This is Titus. Uh, Titus was the uh, subject of a BBC biopic, a documentary about him under the title Titus the Gorilla King. Uh, anyone here watch that? So a few nods. Um, you can probably find it, as I've just been told, you can find all sorts of things uh, on YouTube, either legally or illegally. Um, but Titus's life uh, sadly ended a couple of years ago, um, but it ended naturally and told us something about what you might expect a, a male gorilla uh, to live to. He died at 35 as indeed did one of his um, cohorts from a neighboring group uh, called Pablo, who you'll also see later in the talk. Um, and we've just had news that Cartsby, uh, a silverback who I've known since literally day one, he was born while I was at Karisoki, um, <clears throat> has died at the age of 38. So it seems that 35 to 38 is the a typical age for a successful silverback. Uh, but we also know that Poppy, one of the females I first met uh, 40 years ago this month, uh, is alive and well and still having babies. So clearly uh, females might live a little longer than males and continue to be reproductively active uh, in their dotage. Uh, but it seems that, that being the leader of a group of gorillas is quite stressful. And silverbacks might die younger than, than females, but we've got a very small sample size of individuals whose whole life story we have observed and whose lives have not been cut short by human activity. So enough about Titus. Um, when I first met Titus, he was a, a two-year-old. Um, this is a picture of him before he took leadership of this group, but when he was obviously a significant person within the group. Uh, his story is an extraordinary one, and I don't have time to tell you all about it, but uh, essentially his, his um, father was killed by poachers, his uncle was killed by poachers, and so there wasn't a leader in the group. And he hung out with his big brother, um, and, but he didn't survive. And he ended up uh, sharing a group with an unrelated male, which all the kin selection hypothesis uh, aficionados would say oh, that's not going to happen because they should be rivals. Uh, but during his rather disturbed childhood, when there were a number of poaching incidents that, that tore apart his family, um, the friendships and social bonds that he developed with other members of the group were more important than the genes. Interesting. So Titus. Uh, and my, my knowledge of Titus uh, goes back to 1976. So uh, it was 40 years ago this month that I first went out to Karisoki, uh, which was then a collection of little corrugated iron huts uh, situated at 10,000 feet in the Virunga volcanoes of Rwanda, but very close to the border of what was then Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, and a little further away from the border of Uganda, because those three countries share the Virunga volcanoes, and therefore share this population of the celebrated mountain gorillas. Uh, well, that was me in the late 70s, uh, in a photograph taken by Diane Fossey, uh, and that was our typical um, daily work. Go out, find the gorillas by tracking them from where they were last seen, uh, do a nest count, because gorillas build a new nest every night, and uh, you can count 
the nests and ascertain how many nest builders, I say gorillas, all gorillas over the age of about three or four build a nest. Um, kiddies sleep in their mother's nest. So there you look at the droppings in the nest uh, because uh, females and young obviously have very different sized droppings. And uh, by examining the, the dung, which gorillas tend to leave behind in the nest, uh, you can determine a lot of the details of the group composition without actually seeing the gorillas. And before the work of Diane Fossey, um, that might, all you, might be all you'd see of the gorillas, the nests, and perhaps a fleeting glimpse as they ran in terror from your approach. And that was necessary because uh, up until that point, there was no effective protection for them. So the gorillas saw their human neighbors as enemies to be avoided at all cost. And if the enemy persisted on approaching, then uh, the gorillas would put on their famous display, which would try and intimidate and frighten away uh, the enemy. And that mutual antagonism characterized human gorilla relations um, for, well, for most of our evolution, probably from the point where our evolutionary pathways diverged, uh, we became and remained enemies. Um, but the work of Diane Fossey changed that. Uh, she, of course, was building on the work of George Schaller, who had spent a year studying the, the same population of gorillas. Uh, but she took it further. And actually, her time at Karis Soki spanned a few days short of 19 years. Uh, but we'll come to that later. Uh, speaking of Diane, here she is in, in re representing two aspects of her work. Uh, she went there to study the gorillas and by learning methods of communicating with the gorillas so that you could reassure them, uh, got to the point where not only did the group accept her as an observer, but they interacted with her and parents didn't even mind their infants approaching her because they trusted her. So it's an extraordinary new way of studying wild animals, gaining their trust rather than um, putting an ear tag on or watching them from a distance. Uh, obviously, in a forest, it's very difficult to watch from a distance. So you need to be close if you're going to see anything. And you can't get close because your study animals are terrified of you, so they flee. Uh, so, so Diane's approach, uh, building on Shala's foundation, was to win the trust of the animals uh, but no one expected it to go this far. And in fact, today, this would be regarded as going too far because now we try and maintain a seven meter distance between the gorillas and human observers uh, to minimize the risk of transmission of uh, airborne diseases. Because obviously, if Diane happens to have a cold or flu, uh, Poppy, the female I mentioned earlier, who's still alive today, um, would be at risk of catching it. And whilst her immune system might be used to lo local strains. Um, if Diane had just come back from a lecture tour in the States, she might be bringing a new strain of, of virus. The other photograph is the more controversial one. Um, although I suppose from the health perspective, that's quite a controversial one. But the other one um, shows Diane with one of the anti-poacher patrols that she organized uh, when, in the late 70s, uh, the poaching hit some of our study animals. Now, it was a normal part of our routine at Karisoki uh, to go out each day and monitor the gorillas and s collect data on their behavior and changes within the group composition and so on. Um, but occasionally, we'd come across traps, snares, uh, set for antelope, but capable of um, <laughs> don't you love technology? Uh, capable of catching gorillas too. So what you see there is a patrol that's come back with a teenage uh, poacher who is learning the family business. Uh, he is of a different tribe to the others, though he's a, a batwa, one of the traditional hunter-gatherers of the area, uh, which accounts for the size difference, not just his age, and the remains of a dead bushbuck. Um, but these snares, which are set for antelope, can and sadly still do uh, catch gorillas. And if an infant is caught, they can lose a hand um, because they use, usually can break away from the, uh, the pole spring, but then the snare acts as a tourniquet on the hand, and uh, eventually they'll either lose the hand or gangrene will set in and they'll die. So either they end up, end up with a stump or, or dead. And that's still a problem today, 40 years on. Frustratingly, 
However, that daily routine of uh, getting up from the night nest, feeding for a few hours in the morning until you're feeling full, and then settling down for a rest period. Uh, during the feeding, the gorillas tend to spread out. It's dense vegetation. They can't always see each other, so they keep in touch by saying <coughs> to each other now and again. And when the silverback says, <coughs> you sometimes get an answer from over there, and no gorillas in today, well, you could always ask it. <laughs> you get a reply. And that, that used to be known as a BV, the Belsh vocalization, because it does sound a bit like the belching, but uh, it is actually a deliberate vocalization. It's a contact call. Uh, and by approaching the gorilla making a BV, you don't take them by surprise. Uh, if they don't know you're a human, and, and if you get, you're, you're used to making those sounds, uh, they may be thinking it's a gorilla. But when they look around and see it's a human, if they have become accustomed to tame humans, friendly humans, then they won't be alarmed. They'll carry on feeding. And that was the objective of Diane's process of habituation, as it's called, uh, to bring the gorilla's fear response down to the point where they would largely ignore you. So she wasn't seeking proximity, but proximity came because gorillas are not daft. And when they see a gorilla-like object following them every day, <laughs> they, they are intrigued by you as much as you might be intrigued by them. But Titus here is uh, eating a, a thistle sa sandwich, um, having prepared this by stripping all the leaf and then forming this wadge of leaves, folding over the leaves so that the, the prickly bits of the thistle leaves are tucked inside. Um, the sandwich doesn't actually have any bread on it, so it's just a thick wadge of vegetation, which he was then uh, eating and, and twisting the wrist to tear off bits of it. So it, it is almost like eating a a whole iceberg let it <laughs> as, as indeed you see captive gorillas doing. And he would do that all day. And young, young gorillas learn from their mother mostly what to eat and how to prepare it. So this female is, is plucking sedge flowers. And once she's prepared what looks like a nice little bunch of flowers, <laughs> in they go with the same sort of twist of the wrist and the chew and little bits of stem and so on falling on the head of the baby who's in her lap. Um, that's how baby gorillas learn what's edible. They pick up bits from their mother's uh, feeding behavior and they learn by observation. So they'll pick up stems and start to chew on them and get the flavor of the edible food plants. But during their childhood, they have to learn the botany of the area, so how to identify the plants, and the cuisine, how to prepare the plants so that the bit you want to eat that is nutritious uh, can be can be ingested. Now that, of course, has an impact on the plants, because an animal the size of a gorilla feeding um, clearly impacts on plants. Some plants will die, some plants will be modified. Uh, certainly the woody plants they feed on, particularly if they're pulling off leaf tips, it's like pruning. And when you take off the, the um, apical uh, tip of the, the stem, the meristem, then uh, you tend to, tend to get lateral growth. So when there's a population of gorillas feeding in an area, the plants will not be the same as a similar uh, habitat without gorillas. They modify it. And they also uh, serve to help the plants by dispersing the seeds. And you can see here in this uh, fine gorilla uh, dropping um, some blackberries and some <coughs> pygeum uh, or prunus africana, the African prune which uh, gorillas like to eat and, and therefore act as a seed dispersal agent. We'll come back to seed dispersal later. Um, now, my particular interest while I was at Karasoki in the 70s was the gorilla parasites. And so when, as occasionally happened, a gorilla would come and sit right next to me, I would groom them looking for the uh, gorilla louse, which is a species of louse only found on gorillas. And there's only one other species in the genus, which is a human crab louse or pubic louse. Uh, so, uh, and Pablo here didn't have any lice on his shoulder that I could find, um, but he wasn't there for that long. Uh, and that sort of close contact, as I say, is, is not normal now, but it was um, a delight at the time, because at that point there wasn't thousands of people coming to see the gorillas, and so the risk of disease transmission was much smaller, and it wasn't uppermost in our mind, whereas my research objectives um, saw this as an opportunity. This was actually the only time that I groomed a, a living silverback in the field, and that's because Pablo at that point, although he developed his silver saddle, his secondary sexual characteristics of the crest that 
on the top of the head and the, the losing the hair on the chest. Uh, he hadn't actually um, become the leader of a group, so he was like a, a silverback without portfolio. He was hanging around, uh, fooling around, and he uh, evidently remembered me from his childhood when he used to steal bits of my equipment <laughs> and came and, and uh, sat next to me in, in a way which the then research assistant said he'd, she'd never seen him do before. So I think this wasn't just me hoping that was the case. I think he did recognize the, the bloke with the beard who used to hang out with him when he was a kid. Um, now, all that sort of idyllic interaction with the gorillas um, and living in the forest has changed. And part of the reason for the change was the changing political situation around the park. Um, but throughout the turmoil of the 1990s and the Rwanda civil war and genocide, uh, the conservation work with very few short gaps continued. And that was because we worked with members of the local community who, once it was safe to return home, were keen to return to work because they cared and do care as much about the gorillas as any visiting researchers, uh, particularly those who, who had uh, become employed by the park. Uh, but at the time that our study animals were subject to poaching, when Digit, the famous uh, young silverback who was killed by poachers on the last day of 1977, and then six months later, uh, Uncle Bert and Macho and little Quayley um, were killed by poachers, Diane's response to that was to hire more men to patrol the forest and protect the gorillas. But of course, it's not the job of a visiting researcher from America to set up a an anti-poaching patrol, um, but no one else was doing it. And Diane tried for many years to work with the park guards at that time who were underpaid and not trained and had poor equipment, and there was no motivation. Well, things happily have changed enormously in the intervening decades. And some people feel that, that Diane's death was as a result of her attempt to be a, a one-man savior of the gorillas and getting in the way of um, wealthy people who were either involved in capturing baby gorillas to sell to zoos or smuggling gold through the park or s other illegal activities. And it may be that was the case. I don't think it was that she was murdered by poachers because the poachers had been interacting with her um, for many years and, and there'd never been a suggestion that her life was in danger. Uh, this was a much, I think, higher level uh, engagement to get her out of the picture. And many people felt that her murder would bring an end to all that conservation activity. Uh, in fact, Diane, either through positive example or just being so irritating, had stimulated people to want to either emulate her or do better than her if they felt she wasn't getting it right. And many of those people then rallied around and kept the work going. And the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International continues to do that based out, out of Atlanta in the States. And the UK arm of that organization evolved into the Gorilla Organization, uh, of which I'm, I'm chairman of the trustees now. Uh, and with the various other organizations involved in mountain gorilla conservation, um, the work has gone from strength to strength in ways which you couldn't have conceived of 40 years ago. Now, these people have all paid hundreds of dollars to spend an hour sitting the regulation seven meters uh, from a family of gorillas. And that income has meant that gorilla conservation, instead of being a drain on the budgets of three developing countries, it's actually the mainstay of their economy because it is the most intense and, and exciting and sometimes life perception changing experience that people leave and tell their friends about and they want to come and it's been an amazing success. And yet to get that one hour, you often have to walk, walk for hours up and down muddy, slippery, uh, thistle, nettle covered hillsides with brambles scratching you and, and you get there feeling exhausted and gasping for breath because you might be at seven, eight, or eight nine, 10,000 feet, depending on which park you're in. And, and yet that's an experience which is the basis of um, the funding of the conservation, I think. Of course, there has been a great deal of fundraising around the world for the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, but none of those NGOs could really succeed in the long term without the government's involvement. And we've seen a huge 
change in attitudes. We are now have a UN um, uh, program to coordinate these activities, the UN Great Ape Survival Partnership. And from the mountain gorilla perspective, this has been an amazing success because not only are, are the tourists happy, and not only are the governments happy because of the income, but the gorillas appear to be uh, happy because they're having more babies and, and more babies in the groups that are subjected to tourist visits and researchers visiting the habituated groups than in the unhabituated groups. And it's partly down to the work of the gorilla doctors because now if there are poachers setting snares where there are gorillas, the snared gorilla is seen by a researcher or a tourist and then the veterinary project, uh, which is now loosely known as the gorilla doctors, uh, will make an intervention and remove the snare and save the life of the infant. So infant survival is up and gorilla numbers are rising. But that isn't the case for all the apes and not even for all the great apes and not even for the close relatives of the mountain gorillas, the eastern lowland gorillas on the top left picture there. Uh, this was a postcard campaign that we did in the um, in the 90s. <laughs> Thinking back, yes, I'm sure it was the 90s. Um, where we were asking the British government to help fund ape conservation. Uh, and we were, to some extent, successful because uh, the UK was a big supporter of the UN Great Ape Survival Project as it started and then became a partnership uh, in 2001. But the other apes are all declining, as far as we know. So what is it about mountain gorillas that has succeeded when the other apes are all declining? And what lessons can we apply from mountain gorilla conservation to those others? Well, I guess you might say mountain gorilla conservation has one big advantage, that the people who live around their habitat do not habitually eat apes. That's a good thing. Um, so they, culturally, they're either farmers or cattle keepers, and, and they don't go into the forest and hunt. Or if they do, it's for antelope, not for primate bushmeat. But bushmeat is a problem for every other kind of ape, even for orangutans, although it's not usually so commercial, but uh, recent studies have shown that orangutans face the same threat, and, and gibbons do too. Um, if you've got a shotgun and you've got a family to feed, a gibbon overhead is as good a target uh, or an orangutan as, as is a bush pig or uh, some other ungulate. So uh, mountain gorillas had that big advantage and with habituation came an alternative revenue stream and a alternative job opportunities. So the trackers and guides and porters who carry the tourist bags and the dancers and the craftsmen who make the souvenirs, all those who are part of giving a visitor to Rwanda or Uganda or Eastern DRC an amazing experience gain from that income. And so they don't see a gorilla as potential meat, either culturally or economically. Uh, when you talk to these guys, they say, well, you know, they're, they're meeting a demand, but they will also say it's illegal now. Um, we don't sell protected species meat, uh, but we also know from the busts that are done that, that they do. It's under the counter, and uh, it's an ongoing problem. And it gets complicated when the gorillas. Uh, or other apes are living outside of national parks. Mountain gorillas only live in national parks. And those parks are not only national parks, they're World Heritage sites. They have the highest level of international and national protection. And because of the uh, revenues from tourism, the governments of those countries can afford to pay guards and train them and equip them to protect the forests so their habitat is secure. But all the other kind of great apes, and, and gibbons too, are there are more living outside of protected areas than inside of them. So you have to say to people, look, the law says it's illegal to kill these animals, but they're not in a protected area. So you're allowed to maybe go and hunt for bush pig or s some other uh, f food source. And if you've got a gun and you've had a long day in the forest and you haven't bagged anything, and then you see a protected species, it's a, a tough decision. No, I'm not going to shoot that, even though I know I've got a family depending on me. Um, because it's protected. But do I know anyone who's ever been arrested for shooting? Nope. So if there's no enforcement, and if you've got a wife at home and a child, this lady is, is married to a bushmeat hunter. 
The future of her child depends on him killing animals in the forest and selling the meat. And if the child is sick, then she'll go to a traditional medicine stall, having gone to her uh, healer, and he'll say, I'll go buy a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of the other. And a, a bit of a, a gorilla hand is one of the things that might be prescribed by traditional African medicine. These hands, this one's complete, but that one's got lots of fingers missing because you buy a bit of a finger. And if your baby's sick, you might just tie the finger around the baby's middle so that some of the strength of the gorilla can help cure the child. If it's a, an older child, then you might um, burn the bone black, grind it up into a powder, and then cut the boy's arm and, and rub in the strength of the gorilla. It's like it's been described as vaccinating to give the child the strength of the gorilla. And if you believe that and you have no alternative means of medicine, then that's probably what you're going to do. So even if they stopped eating apes, um, gorilla and chimpanzee hands in traditional African medicine, are, there's a demand there. So apart from obviously improving health care, you need to improve education. And for most people who have never seen a gorilla hand actually holding a piece of food, and the gorilla looking intently at the food, and his mates looking intently to see what he's eating, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just um, a prescription that your healer has told you to go and get. You don't equate it with a living, intelligent, social being uh, in the way that anyone who's worked with or seen documentaries about gorillas might do. So we've got a long way to go. Those last gorillas were Western Lowland gorillas in the Limbe Wireless Center which is, it used to be a zoo, but now it's, it's a sanctuary that takes care of orphans of the bushmeat trade. So infants that aren't killed when their parents are killed uh, would normally be either kept as a pet for the kids in the village or sold to a dealer to go into the international, illegal international trade. And by teaching children while those animals are available for them to see what they look like and, and get them interested in them, uh, and we have messages in pidgin Inge English, as you see on the T-shirt there. Uh, don't eat this kind of meat, bush beef, um, because they'll be finished in a small time. You can get the message across. And if you get a video here of uh, a famous Cameroonian footballer uh, saying that you shouldn't <coughs> eat bush meat. Je suis fier de jouer pour le Cameroun, un pays plein d'animaux sauvages extraordinaires. Les chimpanzés, les gorilles et les éléphants font du Cameroun et des pays voisins un endroit unique au monde. Hélas, ces animaux vont disparaître. La consommation internationale du gibier signifie que notre fond naturel pourrait disparaître pour toujours. Alors, tous ensemble, n'achetons plus du gibier, car en arrêtant d'acheter, nous arrêtons aussi le massacre des animaux. If you can get um, celebrities, be they sports stars or music stars or other people of note, to stand up and say, I don't eat bushmeat because the wildlife has other values that are more important than my appetite, that can help. But if you put a road through a forest, and particularly if you're exporting something from the forest, minerals or logs in this case, and hunters realize that if they hang the animal they've killed outside their house, then it'll be bought for more money than that guy probably gets in a month. And the driver buys it because he knows it. If he takes it to town, he can sell it for twice what he pays for it because the value of something depends on how far it is and how much people are pre be pre prepared to pay. So this diker, which was probably legally shot in a forest which isn't a protected area, so this is legal bushmeat trade, happening um, by the convenience of there being a transport infrastructure and as roads increase in Africa and the f remaining forests are further fragmented by those roads, then you get ribbon development along the roads as people settle. And one of the first things they do, apart from carving out a plot of land to grow some um, root crops, is to begin selling meat. And so what happens is that the forests are being emptied of animal protein and also of lignified tissue, <laughs> uh, trees, branches, anything with lignin that can be converted into charcoal, which is what you see here, bags of charcoal, drive almost anywhere in Africa, you will see bags of charcoal, uh, because that's what most families cook on. So if you can afford to buy meat, you've got to cook it. So you're eating the animals and their habitat at the same time. And the infants might be extra income for the hunter if you can find someone who will get them onto the international market, where their value will be 
a thousand times what the hunter might get. But again, it's, it's the value is according to what someone's prepared to pay for it. And uh, this report that GRASP, the UN Great Ape Survival Partnership, um, put out summarizes it. Just look up stolen apes. You'll find you can download it for free. Uh, it's a serious problem. Sometimes it's happening incidental to the bushmeat trade, but sometimes it's deliberately going out to kill uh, females and anyone else who gets in the way to capture their babies. And the numbers are quite shocking. Uh, this report covered 2005 to 2011, and you can see the numbers. Uh, and when you consider that these are the ones that have been recorded in some way, not the ones that got away, these are the ones that some authority somewhere confiscated, and uh, many of them are in sanctuaries, and, and some of the lucky ones are being put back into the forest. But when you consider that each one of those, uh, usually at least two other animals, certainly one other animal was killed, that's the mother, and if it's, a, if it's an orangutan, it's just the mother. If it's a gorilla or a chimpanzee or bonobo, it's likely that other members of the family would die too. And that not all of the infants that go into trade survive, so there's quite a multiplier effect. The ones that die and their families, the ones that survive and their families who were killed in order that these uh, can be recorded by someone. So, shocking. And yet so few arrests in connection with this. So the Ape Alliance is uh, uh, working with many partner organizations and GRASP to keep the current international focus, which is on international wildlife trade, illegal wildlife trade, um, it tends to be dominated by ivory and rhino horn. And now pangolins are getting in there because they're, they're the most traded uh, uh, protected animal. And, uh, and the big cats, tigers especially. Um, but apes are still a commodity and we have to f keep them in the conversation. Otherwise, the focus won't be on, on the apes. And those are the, the, you know, the gorillas, the chimpanzees, um, the uh, orangutans are the better known apes. Bonobos, most people never heard of. And it's a whole species which is gradually disappearing because its forests are being opened up for timber and mining and they're being hunted for bushmeat and ape, baby apes getting into the illegal trade. But there is uh, a sanctuary in Kinshasa, just outside Kinshasa, and a release site now uh, where bonobos that have been rescued from the illegal trade are put back into the wild. Um, we don't have time to tell stories, uh, but there are lots of stories. <laughs> um, so why is this important? Well, it's important, obviously, because there's a lot of suffering involved. So people who are concerned about animal welfare see the suffering and want to just stop doing horrible things to these interesting animals. Uh, it's important because to many scientists, the fact that we share a lot of DNA with apes makes them special in some way, and it's true. Um, but the bigger picture, which is the one that I often uh, talk about, is their role in forest ecology. Because when apes, apes eat seeds, they disperse those seeds, eat fruit, they disperse the seeds, and, and you see seedlings springing up on the forest floor. Obviously, elephants do that too. And there are some species whose seeds are so big that only elephants can eat them. This is actually elephant droppings with seedlings growing out. But uh, apes are important in that role too. And gorillas are second only to elephants in the number of seeds that they disperse and the distance they, they carry them. And the fact that they're big and powerful, and, and this is um, Chimanuka, who is one of the biggest um, and most powerful because he's a member of the eastern lowland gorilla subspecies and although he, he looks dramatic here um, he's actually yawning not, not roaring or screaming uh, you see he's lost half of his upper right uh, canine tooth uh, in a fight with another silverback probably Mugaruka um, who you'll see in a moment but his uncle and several uh, relatives were killed by bushmeat poachers so although he lives only about 100 miles from where the mountain gorillas live, uh, eastern lowland gorillas have some humans in their area who do eat apes. So that puts them at a disadvantage. And they're also living in an area which is politically very unstable, as indeed Rwanda has been 20-odd uh, years ago, but now is, is calm. And eastern DRC is still subject to that problem. And when protected species are living in protected areas, you have a focus of attention. So where 
the park guards who have continued their work throughout the turmoil of the um, civil wars in, in the DRC, uh, with help of NGOs like Born Free and um, uh, Fauna and Flora International and the guerrilla organization, a lot of organizations have, have helped. These are not so as well known as, as the mountain gorillas, but um, they have threats which touch everyone in the developed world. These lads are down a mine. They told me it was their school holidays and they were just earning a bit of pocket money. But in some parts uh, where the mines are controlled by armed gangs, um, kids and, and in fact whole villages are coerced into digging out the minerals which find their way onto the open market so that we can have a cell phone and a laptop. Because in Eastern DRC, the, um, the ground bears many valuable minerals. And this is the subject of another um, UNEP report uh, published with Interpol. And although it's called the last stand of the gorilla, this is probably the more important bit, environmental crime and conflict in the Congo Basin. Because it shows you that it's not just, are oh, the poor gorillas who are being killed. This is actually uh, armed gangs funding their terrorist, uh, uh, terrorist program by digging out minerals. And the workers that they're forcing sometimes to dig out the minerals, they feed on bushmeat. So it's, it's all the nasties rolled into one. Terrorism, because believe me, these people terrorize villages, um, killing of endangered species, uh, destroying habitat. And yet, none of us can say hand on heart, the phone in my pocket has no tantalum from the DRC in it, because it very likely does. So why is it that some of the richest industries in the world, telecommunications and, and uh, uh, computer companies, can't sort it out. Well, there have been efforts to set up model mines and to set up a, a clean supply chain. But as you'll know, if you ever looked into uh, supply chains of other commodities, certification is not simple. But there needs to be a system of certification so that in areas where mining is allowed and it's done properly and safely without using child labor, people who, who are lucky enough to live near them can prosper and not be dependent on scrabbling around in the dirt. The impact of that mining alongside the civil unrest uh, is that gorillas such as Muguruka here um, were killed, and elephants, and chimpanzees, and buffalo. In fact, all the large mammals in this region have been hammered to feed miners. And the miners are digging stuff that, that we're paying for. How do we change that? Well, as individuals, you, you, can't, you can't, what can you do? You can not buy a phone. You can recycle your phone when you're finished with it. Yeah, that's good. Um, but really, it needs legislation. It needs governments to say, no, companies shall not buy uh, uncertified products if they're contributing to the destruction of animals that are not only important for all the reasons we mentioned, but because they're part of this rainforest ecosystem. Um, now, the Ape Alliance has a website, as you've seen a couple of times, and one of the areas is, enables you to uh, keep up to date with, with the signs of um, the interactions between apes and their habitat and the rest of the world. And I put this slide in um, because uh, this is a scene from, for those of you who watched um, the gorilla family and me last Christmas, uh, of Eastern Northern gorillas feeding in the top of a tree. And the role of gorillas in the life cycle of these trees is what I want to focus on. Because, um, uh, and, and while I'm talking about the gorilla family and me, we're having a, uh, an event at which that will be screened on the... 2nd of February. 2nd of February, thank you. you see, I need someone with a brain to tell me these things. Um, and one of the reasons why we want people to care about the apes is their role in the ecosystem. Now, we've just had the... Um, 2016 climate talks in Marrakesh this year, last year, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement uh, brought this, this concept of reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation into reality. Uh, REDD, if you're not aware of it, please look it up because it's, it's a way of protecting forests, preventing their destruction uh, in order that they can continue to play the role that they play. Now, in the climate talks, the, the focuses on carbon sequestration and storage. But this map, animated map, 
shows you another important function. If you look at this, this is global precipitation patterns. And you can see the white is supposed to be water vapor, which you can't see except when it condenses. And the orange is storms. And we've got um, the Pacific in the middle, unusually for a map. But just this is the, the bulge of West Africa. And that is the, the clock ticking down here. So the hours are too fast to see, but the, the, the days are about happening one a second. And that matches the, the orange pulsing in the Congo Basin. And that's the daily rainfall, because it's a rainforest, so you expect it to rain. But what you might not have realized is that those, those weather systems that set up over the uh, Congo Guinean forests move westwards across the Atlantic and join the bigger pump in the Amazon, which then sends off weather systems to water the fields in North America and, and in Europe. Uh, or some of it comes down here and bounces off the Andes and comes across and waters Australia and New Zealand. So whether you like your wine from Spanish or Californian or South African or Australian or New Zealand, if you buy a bottle of wine that's growing in vineyards that are being watered by rain, you can trace that water through weather systems back to rainforests. And there are two, Nobel, uh, two, two physicists in, in Russia who have been uh, nominated for a Nobel Prize for the concept of the biotic pump, which they've tried to explain. But it does seem that, that rainforests are important not just because they make the great places to make documentaries or go on holidays, but because they're part of the global, uh, the biosphere in which we all live. The people that live closest to those forests probably know least about that aspect of them. Um, but the Ape Alliance is trying to solve that by taking uh, this information in film form into schools where they don't have electricity. And we do that by means of pedal power cinema. So the, the guy at the front on a bicycle is actually generating the power to show the films about the apes, which are actually just a few miles down the road, but which none of them have got the money or the time or the access to go and see. So they're learning about their own natural history, but using their own energy to do so. It really is an empowering, in every sense of the word, uh, occasion when you get a thousand kids in a church hall and uh, a couple of them on bikes pedaling away. That's the, uh, the Great Ape Film Initiative use of pedal-powered cinemas to deliver a conservation education message. For those around the world who are online, the Ape Alliance has worked with vicotourism.org, uh, which enables you to visit the apes virtually, uh, either on your screen or tablet, uh, or the, the latest thing we've just re released with Grasp is a, an app. Uh, so if you've got a VR headset, you can download Ape App VR onto your phone and, and put it in the headset, and you can visit all six species of great ape um, and an extra gorilla subspecies, because we had it, uh, with, for free and with almost zero carbon footprint, although you will need a bit of tantalum in the phone. You can't get away from that. So the message we're trying to convey is that, that fighting climate change means protecting the forests, and protecting the forest is not just the trees. It's the animals that are important components in the forest ecosystem. And we get that message across in every way we can, not least by giving talks like this. Uh, anyway, thanks for coming. Uh, we have to get out now because these really stroppy people are going to come back in and kick <laughs> us out. <laughs> um, good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.